I'm Dr. Yvonne Kaysan, the president of Spiritual Awakenings International. Welcome to our special SAI Presents Holiday Edition. <laughs> Thank you for taking the time to join us today. Spiritual Awakenings International, we are delighted to say, has grown to 90 countries around the world and every state in the United States and all across Canada. It's awesome. So please take a moment now and put into the chat just type into the chat where you're joining us from today. We love to know where everyone's joining you from. I'm joining you from Toronto, Canada. And uh, our speaker today is joining us from mm, somewhere in the USA. She will tell us when she comes on to speak. And so, uh, and uh, our vice president, Robert Baer, is joining us from Oregon. I see Texas. I see Ottawa, North Carolina. Welcome, everyone, from wherever you're joining us from. Long Island. Awesome. So it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Reverend Dr. Norma Edwards. She's a near-death experiencer, a spiritual therapist, and a certified NLP life coach. She is also the founder and CEO of Reprogram Your Life, designing innovative, strength-based programs that foster sustainable change. She was born in Guyana, South America, and has traveled the world and studied under the tutelage of eight spiritual masters. She is a motivational speaker and a talk show host of Spirituality 101 on Voice America. Reverend Edwards is the author of the fascinating book, Awakening. And I'll just sneak in here. And she just had her birthday this week. Happy birthday. <laughs> it is my pleasure to introduce Reverend Dr. Norma Edwards. Well, hello. And thank you, Yvonne, for that wonderful introduction. I am Norma. And it is a delight and a pleasure to share with you, uh, first of all, the near that experience, or what I call the paradigm shift that happened at the age of 26. And now at the age of 81, when I fully digested that and turned it this way, that way, and integrated what I brought back with what I was taught by eight spiritual teachers, I am here to tell you a little bit more about that transformation and how it is that one can make the same leap with or without um, a near-death experience. So thank you so much, Yvonne, for uh, offering me the opportunity to be able to share, to share my experience today. And um, I am sure that um, I will starly enjoy this and I'm looking forward to questions at the end of the presentation. So I said, my name is Norma. I say it that way because the I am that we put in front of our names is the divinity that we carry. And if you notice, there's nobody else in the world that could say, I am Yvonne Kaysen. <laughs> You're the only one who can do that. So when I say I am Norma, what I'm stating is that I am a piece of divinity, and that Norma is my first name, which was whispered to the person who named me. And in my first name and yours is, is locked in the information about the plan that we created and which we will walk that plan into existence while we're here on earth. So when I say I am normal, I'm introducing you to the fact that I'm divine like everybody else, but that normal constitute the whole plan that I came with. So it was a Monday morning in London, England. That's where I lived at the time. I was 26 years of age. I had been away from work on and off because I was not feeling well. And the doctors couldn't find out what was wrong with me. 
So it was my first day back on the job. I still was not feeling very well, but I felt an obligation that I should go in, you see. So I dropped my baby off at um, the doctor's, my toddler off at the, at the, I'm sorry, dropped my toddler off at the babysitter and made my way into work. And as the day progressed, the pain inside of me expanded. And at four o'clock, I looked at the clock and it dawned on me that this seemed like labor pains. And I asked if I could leave early and I got into the elevator and the only other person in the elevator was a Hindu woman. She was wearing her Hindu outfit, the dot on the forehead. And you know, in those days, in the sixties, elevators stopped with a, with kind of a, a little bit of a crunch. And when that elevator stopped, all hell broke loose inside of me, I collapsed. And um, this young lady who eventually became a very good friend of the family. She was very quick in her thinking because St. Bartholomew's Hospital was not very far away. So instead of calling an ambulance, she got people to help her and they got me into a cab and got me to the hospital. When I got to the hospital, I was more or less unconscious, but in the middle of the activity, et cetera, I kind of regained consciousness and I was on a trolley and they were moving me into um, operating room. And the doctor said to me, I had a dead baby inside of me that had been dead for four months and it was poisoning my system and they had to go in and, and, uh, and then I kind of like lost consciousness again. But when I lost consciousness, it was excruciating pain. The next thing I know is <laughs> I'm conscious, but I'm on the ceiling and I'm looking down and I'm looking down at my body on an operating table, there were two doctors and a couple of nurses, and they are they, they seem very frantic. Well, now I am the pain is gone, and I'm feeling perfectly well, and I am trying to get this information to the doctors and nurses that it's okay. You don't have to be so scared. I'm I'm fine. But um, they don't seem to be able to recognize me, and and this was important for me when I came back to recognize that in that state, I was processing very well. Because in that state, the thought that came to me is, how do I get off of this ceiling? And as soon as I had the thought, I found myself on the floor, and I'm now speaking to, um, trying to speak to these doctors, and I'm saying to them, look, you don't need to be so anxious. I'm fine, I don't know what happened, but I'm fine, the pain is gone, I'm okay. And I'm running from one to the other and they don't seem to be able to recognize me at all. So I stopped for a moment there and I thought, well, there are female nurses in the room and females are more intuitive than men. So I begin the search now running from one nurse to the other. And again, they're completely ignoring me. And now I'm really, really baffled. Well, in the midst of all that now, the graph on the wall flatlines. And, and ordinarily, I know what that means because I've got family members who are nurses. And I'm looking at the graph and I thought, there's something wrong with this room. First, they can't see me. Now the equipment in the room is malfunctioning. <laughs> I got to get out of here before they accidentally kill me. And so with that thought, I found myself rising, rising, rising through the ceiling. And I'm moving through an extremely dark tunnel. What was interesting about that is I was not afraid at all. I was just kind of surprised at the depth of the darkness. And I'm moving, it seemed, almost at the speed of light. And I come around a curve. And when I come around a curve, I could see the end of the tunnel. And at first, it represented what I call the kaleidoscope of light. It seemed like every color in the rainbow and some other colors were like present at this place at which I had to exit from the tunnel. And as I got closer, the other colors faded. And now I'm looking at entering crystal clear white light. And I remember thinking again, when you are in that state, your processing is very, very, very acute. I remember thinking, 
if I entered this phenomenal field of light, I probably would lose my sight because it would probably damage the intensity of the light would damage my eyes. And then I merged. And I have to tell you, there are no words in any language. If you take all the languages we have in the world and put it together to describe the beauty, the joy, the sheer happiness, the peace of entering light, it, it just are no words to describe. And as I entered, I became aware that I had now become love. Love was not something I was looking for anymore. I had become, my whole being had become love. And of course, the first question in my head is, well, how do I get around in this environment? And no sooner I ask the question, I'm moving. And I'm moving and um, very, very swiftly again. And I come to a screen. The very first screen was kind of an average screen. And uh, the screen began to scroll. And as it began to scroll very slowly, I could see that the screen was divided into three columns. The column on the left carried the information that was written in my plan when I entered my body as a baby. The column in the middle was how well I was doing with what I had placed in that plan. <laughs> and the third column, <laughs> It's as though someone had made a stamp and the stamp said, objective not accomplished, objective not accomplished, objective not accomplished. And so I'm moving my head from the left-hand side and going, but wait a minute, the objective was really quite clear. What was wrong with me? It was not at all a judgmental assessment. If anything else, I was amused and I kept wondering, well, how could I have been so stupid not to know that there was a plan? But each, each column, each section, I can see what it is I planned. And then I can see how I lived and how I lived had nothing to do with what I had planned. And on the third column, objective not accomplished. So every one of my, my objectives had not been accomplished. <laughs> and that was because... I was busy following what the world says is the equivalent of success. So the screen comes to an end, and now I'm confused. Well, how could I have lived a whole lifetime and not accomplished anything at all? And, and, and I mean, I really thought I had accomplished a lot. We had immigrated to a, to a new country. We had immigrated from Guyana, South America, to England. And getting an education, uh, raising children, I thought I was accomplishing a lot. But according to this review I had just done, I had not accomplished anything that was important in that plan that I had set for myself. So that I, when I was growing up as a child, I think I came in with more than five senses because I had all these questions. And we were a very religious family. We went to church every Sunday. And every Sunday on the way home, I would have questions about the sermon. But the one question that kept coming up and nobody could answer was the question that Christ said, I came so that you can have life and have it abundantly. And then I would ask the pastor, but how come people are still dying? Did he really mean that or was he lying? Well, at that point, my mother sat me down and said, no, when you go to church, I want you to close your eyes. Don't even look at pastor <laughs> because you are asking him questions he cannot answer. And standing there now kind of wondering why it is that I had not fulfilled any part of my plan, this question popped in my head again. And when it popped in my head again, I started moving. I'm moving again very swiftly. And I now move and I come to a stop. At later on, I will discover it's the Akashic Records. At the time, I'd never heard of the word Akashic Records. And when I stop, this is now a humongous screen. I don't even think even today we have a screen as big as that. 
And I've stopped at what looks like a Colosseum with the, you know, the big pillars. And stretched across the two pillars was this humongous screen. And again, the screen lit up. When the screen lit up, it began to scroll very slowly. And now I'm observing six past lifetimes. Except I'm not only observing, but I'm experiencing the emotions. And um, I I'm kind of amazed because up until then, I'd never heard of reincarnation. I'd never even heard the word reincarnation, didn't have a word for it. But now they have dropped these six incarnations into the scroll of the life I just left so that I can understand why it is that I wrote the program I wrote and why it is very important. I think at that point they were thinking that I wasn't, that I had to be sent back to finish my assignment. The very first lifetime was way, 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 way back in the dark ages. And everywhere there was darkness. And I'm not sure if that was because it was night or because it was just the dark ages. And people were walking around with torches, lighted torches. And they had gathered a group of us, women and children, and we're moving through a cave to get to the ocean. When we got to the ocean, there were all these boats. There were boats there, not very big boats. And um, what little food they could gather, because you see, the tribe was in at war with another tribe. And the tribe that I belonged to was not winning the war. And so, so they were very concerned to find a way to protect the women and children so that they could repopulate. Now, I'm experiencing this and I'm experiencing how people feel about this, that, that the children were taken away from their mothers and, and, and there were 23 women and 10 children. We were put in a boat and the boat was pushed out to sea in the hope that we would survive because there was, you know, war taking place. Well, the boat capsized and we all drowned. And I realize now because I'm looking at that and then it kind of flips back to the life I just left. And the life I just left, I had an extreme fear of the ocean. I loved it. It drew me to it. I lived in a tropical country, but I would go to the beach where you couldn't get me to go into the water. And then I realize now where the fear came from that held me back from enjoying the water. I love to sit there and watch it, but I was afraid to get in it. That was the first. Um, that was the first lifetime I lifetime I experienced, and then the screen shifted, and now I'm a warrior. I'm a male, and I'm a warrior, and it's war, and I'm very much. I mean, I'm very much out there. It's kill or be killed, and I'm experiencing this. I'm experiencing what this fears, what this feels like. I'm also very acutely aware. Uh, that the warrior is not afraid of dying, even though there's death all around. And, and I'm, I'm paying attention to this. I'm curious about this, you see. Uh, then the screen moved from there to, um, to a place now where I'm a female. And I am at the place where Moses is being extracted from the water as a baby. And it was a group of women. I was one of those women. And there was a lot of discussion and a lot of fear because Moses had no business among, you know, the, the, the who we were at the time. And there, again, I could feel the fear if, if well, if you keep this baby, uh, we could be in a lot of trouble, you know. Um, and being there and feeling the fear of that and, and, and listening to the discussion as to what should be done with this to, to keep this baby alive. And then from there, I moved to um, a very interesting place. I would say the only, well, maybe the only part of the New Testament. I am um, I'm at the cross. And I'm screaming at the top of my lungs, crucify him. 
and experiencing that that experience of of um again fear fear of the unknown fear of what had been fed into us you know that 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 um, he's, he's he's pretending to be somebody he's not blah, blah, blah. but feeling all that fear inside of me and then i moved from there to um paul paul crucifying crucifying the christians and the point at which he was struck down from the horse and had that whole experience of surrendering of surrendering to the very to the very power that he he um, he was attacking and again to experience that the feelings you know the feelings and the emotions that came with that and then they swiftly moved me now and again fear 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 of what would become of us with fear of well he's we're not sure what kind of doctrine he's teaching you see what i'm saying and then i moved from there now and i am on a plantation and i'm a child and I'm picking cotton right alongside my mother. And again, fear. Uh, and I can hear the hoof of the master on the horse. And I know that when he comes around that turn, and I can also hear the sound of the whip on the back when the, when the cotton picker could not keep up with their quota. And I know that when he gets to me, I will feel that whip because I'm a child and I can't keep up with the coat. And um, and as he comes around the corner and the most fearful, the scene changed. And when the scene changed, I am now a white man on a horse wielding that whip. And the, the, the oh my God, the fear, the, the unknown, how, how could this be? Because you're feeling the energies as you move from one to the other. And, um, and then the scenes came to an end. And then I stopped for a moment there and realized that each one of them carried a tremendous amount of fear. And then I moved from that. I asked the question, well, well what next? And when I asked the question, what next? Now, I was very quickly moved from there and moving again very swiftly. And I am now at the river. You know, for those of us who um, sang hymns in church, yes, we will gather by the river, the beautiful, the beautiful river. Gather with the saints at the river. It flows from the throat of God. And on the other side of this river, were hundreds, they were, I think, 365, I knew the exact number, of souls waiting to greet me. And again, I could feel and I could experience, as they stretched their hands out towards me, I could feel and experience the amazing amount of love that emanated from, from them to me and how excited they were to meet me and to greet me and... um helped me to know that, that that this was a meeting that was always planned and it was perfectly normal. And I stepped into the water now to kind of cross the river to move towards them. And in stepping into the water, I remembered thinking, oh, I've overcome my fear of the water. And I started walking towards them. And then my aunt, who was the very last person to have died at that time she stepped into the water and began to move towards me but the love oh my god these, these, these souls are standing there and, and they're so excited they can't wait for me to get across across the river you know and my aunt steps into the water now I grew up I always felt I grew up with two mothers because my, mo my mother and her sister were very close but my, my aunt didn't have children and so um, my mother had three. And so I always thought of my aunt as my extra mother, you know. And just as we're about to embrace each other, 
she steps back and she says, no, I'm sorry. They're sending you back. And I said, why? And she said, they're sending you back with a message. And I said, but there are millions of people back there. Surely <laughs> they could find a way to drop this message in somebody's head. I'm not going back. And she says, I'm sorry, you don't have a choice. And at that point, I became very sad. Because it, it's, it, it's, it speaks to the beauty and the joy and the love of the other side. That even though I had a son and a husband back on earth, I didn't want to come back. I didn't know I want to come back. And she says, I'm sorry, but um, you have to go. And they're sending you with a message. And the message is, there is no death. Life is eternal. And with that, I found myself, and when I say myself, our spiritual body is humongous. And <laughs> the, the journey out was quite pleasant. But when they started stuffing me back in that body, it was not at all. I was not a happy camper at all. <laughs> I mean, because it's a humongous field of energy, you see, and, and I think this is why so many of us near that experiences when we come back, we're very aware that we're not this human body, we're this phenomenal energy field, you see. And they started to shock this energy field in this body. And again, excruciating pain. I was brought back to the world, excruciating pain. And um, I didn't like it at all. Did not like it at all. So I'm I'm in a, a recovery room, I'm assuming, and there are two nurses sitting at a, just outside the door, the, the, the recovery room has got glass, like a sheet of glass where a window should be. And they're observing me, you see. And it seemed like these two nurses, they're friends, and they attended the same church. One worked on the Sunday and the other one didn't. So the one who went to church is now summarizing the sermon from the Sunday service. And she's talking about, you know, only those who, who um, accept Jesus Christ. And, say, and, and I'm outraged. I'm lying there in this recovery room and I'm outraged. Well, how could a pastor get on a stage, get in a pulpit and say words like that? And then it dawned on me, but wait a minute, Norma, when you woke up this morning, you thought that way. What is it that changed so dramatically that here you are? I mean, I, I'm so I'm so angry at, at the th just at the thought of wo words like this, you know, being uttered on a, on a, on a pulpit. And um, but I can't speak, you see, because they got they got this stuff in my throat. I can't speak. I can't speak up. So then after she had finished explaining the, the sermon, they turned on a little transistor radio they had sitting on the table. And it was tuned to classical music. And I'm lying there. I can see the notes. Every note is linked to a color. Every color is linked to the first seven numbers. <laughs> and <laughs> I could see the, 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 the numbers and the colors rising, and I could see them taking it in there, inhaling it. And as I began to inhale it, I could see that one of the nurses, I thought, oh, my God, she's here taking care of us, and she has no clue she has cancer, because I can see inside of the body. And I am just overwhelmed with all of this because all I could think about when I woke up this morning, none of this was happening in my life. How could all of this happen in just a few hours? And the journey existing in the human body continued. Now I have to tell you, I was seriously depressed. I experienced three years of serious depression, three years when I tried to take my life three times. The second time I tried to take it and I failed. Now I'm depressed because I can't even take my life. <laughs> three years of serious depression. And um, 
when I attempted it the very when I tried to attempt it the very last time and they intervened. And um they hauled me up to the Council of Nine. And when I got there, um I was not allowed to speak. I was muted. Uh, I was just there to listen. And what they told me is that if I tried it again, they would allow me to succeed. Except that as soon as I got to the other side, I would be forced back into a baby's body. Now, you can imagine what that did to me because forcing my spirit into a grown-up body was painful enough. I couldn't imagine forcing this humongous spirit into a baby's body. And they told me that, you know, that's what would happen and I'd be forced into a baby's body with full memory. And if I thought what I was experiencing was bad, that would be infinitely worst. So I um, I had no choice. I had no choice but to, to accept what came to me. Now, in those days, you know, they kept you in hospital for quite a few days. Uh, first of all, the very first night they put me out into a ward. In those days, you know, you got like six or eight people in a ward. They took me out into the ward and I had no sleep, really, trying to figure out what had happened to me, what was this transition about. I had had no sleep. And um, they took me out into the ward. And the next thing I know is <laughs> there is this woman in the ward and she's afraid she's going to die, you see. And you know, in those days, your visitors came for one hour and then they left. Um, and she's crying out. Oh, she's crying out to God. She's crying out to Mother Mary. She must have been Catholic. Oh, and, and I'm trying to sleep. So I push myself up and I says, ma'am, you have 10 more years to live. <laughs> Just in case you don't know it, you've got 10 more years to live. So please, will you stop? <laughs> And the nurses are kind of like looking at me really strange. And now I'm thinking, but wait a minute, how did I know that? How was I so sure? I was so sure of that, you see. Um, and the journey began. The day I left the hospital was very interesting. It was a summer, it was a winter's day. And trees were all, you know, devoid of, of leaves. And as I stepped out the door, I could see the energy moving in the trunk of the trees. And it's moving, it's pulling the energy up from the earth and pulling it all the way up to the top to release it, to keep the trunk of the trees alive. And th that was another awesome experience. And then my journey, my journey started um, of adjusting to the transformation that I had come back with. So now I want to, um, I want to shift to my, oh dear. Ah, there we are. Now I want to shift to the near, the, the, I told you about the near that experience, the transformative effects and changes that I went through. First of all, there was a journey to the other side of the veil. Then there was the experience of what I call love unspeakable and full of glory. Then there was review of the Akashic record. Then I was greeted by family and friends on the other side. Then I was sent back with a message. And that message was, there's more to life than meets the eye. Life is eternal. Yeah, so that's what I related, the journey to the other side, the love unspeakable and full of glory, my God, the review of the Akashic record, and then greeted by family and friends with so much love. So I want to say to people that you will see your loved ones when you get to the other side. They're all there waiting, and it's not just the loved ones from this lifetime, but it's the loved, it's the loved ones from all the lifetimes you've lived. So there were, for me, over 300 people waiting to greet me. But in my case, they sent me back with a message. And um, that was... There's some contact information, but I want to go back. I want to go back so we can talk about what it means to come back after you have a paradigm shift. 
That's what I call it. It's a paradigm shift. And it's more information than you can even take in in a whole lifetime on this side of the earth that is kind of like rammed into you very, very, very quickly. And so what it does is, what it does is, is um, for me, I needed some help to help me to understand uh, what I had just experienced. And that began the journey of um, that began the journey that began the journey of adjusting of adjusting to the fact that um, first of all life is eternal. You wrestle with um the religious teachings that you have had. One of the things that for me, other people have a different way, but for me, I really wanted to understand because all, all of my life I had been reading the Bible and so on, and I really wanted to know what the truth was. So I made a dedication. I went on a 40 day vigil of asking that I should be shown the truth. I wanted to know the truth of the matter. And I didn't want to read it out of a book I wanted to be, because by this time I knew it could be transformed into me. And what actually happened was I was asked by the other side to be sure to get to bed at eight o'clock at night. And I'd sleep from eight to 11 and they would download information into me. And then I'd wake up at 11 o'clock to do my housework, etc. And that went on for three years in order to help me to understand um, what, had, what had taken place in my life, what that shift meant, and why it is I, it seemed to me I was carrying a whole lot of information that was like contrary to what I had been taught. And I guess what I really, for me, I can only speak for myself, what I was told was, you got the kindergarten version. <laughs> And like every classroom and every school, you've got to go from classroom to classroom so you can expand your expand the understanding and the information that you have been that has been downloaded into you. That led to eight spiritual teachers. Each one had a particular aspect um, to teach me. And two things that stood out for me in, in the years was discipline. The universe is well-ordered and well, very well-disciplined. And if you want to understand the secrets of the universe, you've got to get yourself aligned with discipline. You've got to become very authentic. And so I had spiritual teachers who didn't teach me, well, this is the way you get what you want, or this is the way, but rather help me to develop discipline and help me to understand that um, uh, uh, being authentic is, is very important and being of service is very important. So I went through eight spiritual teachers, uh, one of which, if you pick up my book, Awakening, it was a husband and wife. He was in his 90s and she was 87. And they literally walked me through the Bible. Every holy book has got information that we need. One is not better than the other. They all carry information that we need depending on where we live and what our consciousness is. And since we live more than one lifetime, we have to live through all those books. We have to, we, we live every single one of them before we eventually is allowed to leave the earth. So that is where the wisdom keeping comes in because it, it, it required, I was required, I read seven holy books and I had teachers who guided me in understanding that. Um, so I'd like to stop there. When I came back, I came back with expanded senses. Of course, I could see things, I could hear things, I could. But my focus was on how do I get to the other side? I needed to know if it took a near that experience that allowed me to travel to the other side, what would it take for me to travel consciously? 
that took years of training and eventually took me to the 16th dimension, which I can travel quite naturally now. I, I'd like to stop there and ask, what are your questions? Because I know we've had people putting questions in there. I, I, I'm really interested in, in hearing what people would like to know. What would you like to know, Yvonne? Awesome. Well, thank you, Aunt Norma. That was absolutely incredible. So, yes, please, if anyone has any questions for Norma, uh, please uh, put them into the chat. Uh, if you can write them into the chat, and then I will uh, read the questions to Norma so that she can answer them. So, uh, Robert has a question for you to start things off, Norma. Um, you know, you were raised as a Christian. Did you see and interact with Jesus, uh, Robert would like to know? No, I did not. I think I already knew Jesus very well. <laughs> I already knew Jesus very well. So I, don't, I think, you know, the short space of time I had over there, they didn't, they didn't make the introduction. I wish they had. <laughs> All righty. Uh, Maud would like to know, Thank you. Wow. Could you explain further about the dimensions? Ah, I don't think you have time for all the, all the dimensions, but I'll try. <laughs> Our home is on the other side. You know, if you live in, in America or if you live in the world, you have a street address. And then regardless of where you travel, eventually you come home. Our home is on the other side. This is the longest time you'll spend in the classroom <laughs> in any one of the dimensions. You know, you come here, you spend 90 years, 80 years, 70 years, you are in school. Um, so when we talk about the dimensions, we're talking about the levels, you know, in, in and, and, and I'm a reverend, so I have to say this. In the Bible, it says, in my father's house, there are many mansions. Many mansions, meaning many dimensions, and every dimension is like you can travel to, you can travel to um, Germany from America. You can travel to the Caribbean islands. Each one of those places have got um, different kind of landscape, etc. Every one of these dimensions have got frequencies that go with them, and so it's it's our job to experience the human experience, get into the human body and learn the things we need to learn uh, so that we can eventually have the ability to travel from one, from one dimension to the other. Interesting. Well, we have several questions. Uh, sorry, we have several questions. I'm having trouble putting me in the spotlight. Here we go. Uh, about the 16th dimension that you talked about, so several people have asked, did you say the 16th dimension? And what is happening in the 16th dimension? And someone else is asking, how do you train yourself to reach the 16th dimension? So don't, Norma. <laughs> you don't train yourself. You see, here we have been taught, you got to go find somebody and they'll give you information and you train. You work on your expanding your awareness and after you've learned to expand your awareness, you're asking questions, you're looking, you're not taking things in just because somebody told it to you. That was part of the, the eight, eight teachers that I had. It, it, they didn't teach me how to go to the 16th dimension. They taught me how to keep your awareness open, ask questions, be alert, create a sacred time, what some people would call meditation. You have to create certain time. And I did not go looking to get to this. I didn't know 16 dimension existed. But as you become more centered, as you become more aware, as you become more disciplined, as you get to really know, not just believe uh, that this earth is just a school, it's, it's not your home, uh, you begin to long for home. And when you've had that experience briefly of, 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 um, finding yourself on the other side where there's all that love, then what develops inside of you is this, this, this amazing need to get there. It's not that you know that there's a mention. 
As a matter of fact, it wasn't until I, I did the first travel out of my body and the person who escorted me out had to count, count it up, not down, uh, that I realized that I'd gone as far as 16. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you sit down and, well, for me, it wasn't something that I sat down and planned to do. All I knew was I wanted to re-experience that amazing love uh, and light that I experienced on the other side. So Cindy has another question about the 16th dimension. What What is happening in the 16th dimension? What is it like on the 16th dimension? That's where the Akashic record exists. And so when I go when I go out, I'm going to the record, quite frankly. I've never really thought about looking around to see. I go straight to the record because I need to, I, I, in, in trying to understand who I am and why I'm here and what my purpose is, that's where I got the information from. Mm -hmm. And Dana would like to know, did your fear of the ocean go away after you had that first uh, past life memory come up? Oh, yes. No, you can't get me out of the water. <laughs> As a matter of fact, this is very interesting. Um, I do water aerobics uh, three times a week. And I do it with 22 other women. <laughs> Don't you find that interesting? Some of whom are Jewish. Some of whom are black, some of whom are white, and some of whom are Middle Eastern. And um, there are 23 of us in that pool. And I get the sense that we're all there because of this fear that we had of water. Mm -hmm. I also believe that they were the women with whom I entered that boat. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Uh, Victoria has a question for you. How can we find out how we are doing with our plan? Discipline, discipline, authenticity is the key. You see, each of us have got a main guide. When we came to Earth, we were assigned a main guide. And it's interesting, when I see the guides, I see them pouring over maps. They've got these maps, you know, and they're very, very busy kind of like making sure that we're kind of following the patterns that we set for ourselves. See what I'm saying? When we are in spirit, we are, we know everything. We're completely all knowing, much the same like they say, you know, the spirit of God is on all knowing. We're all knowing when we're in the spirit. So when we are setting up a lifetime, it's not really about getting rich and, and being completely joyous and happy. Happiness and joy and peace comes. But we came here to learn. And we choose the circumstances that will best teach us what we don't know, what we haven't experienced. Because people say, well, if I wrote a plan, why would I write a bad plan? Because maybe you had four lifetimes when you did nothing but enjoy yourself. And in the fifth lifetime, you finally got to the place where, you know, I really do need to learn about compassion. And one of the most powerful ways of learning about compassion is to experience some stuff that will take you there. You see what I'm saying? So when we write our plan, we're writing the plan because we have got all of the information in front of us. How we have lived, where we have lived, why we have lived, what is missing. And for many, many, many of us, we don't realize it when we are on planet Earth. We are members of teams that will eventually rule other planets. And we are here to learn. Mm -hmm. And one of the basic things we are here to also do is to show we don't take this mess we call Earth with us to another planet. So can you see why it is we sometimes write very difficult and challenging experiences into our lifetime here. Because we know this is only school. It's not the end of our life, nor is it the end of the world. Am I making sense? I hope I am. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Fascinating. Linda has a question now related to this. She says, what is the lesson learned that will allow you to leave Earth forever? It's not one lesson. It's not two lessons. 
It's complete change. It's a complete change of your rhythm. It's a complete change of your thinking. When we come to earth, we came to learn a specific thing. And I can only speak for my own lifetime. This lifetime here, I had seven things to accomplish. That does not mean that I've learned everything that I need to learn. You see what I'm saying? So when I leave, I look at the record and I will go, okay, I accomplished maybe six of those seven. Now I still have one outstanding to which I would add another six uh, items and I get reincarnated. It's, it's like people think that you could just determine, well, I, I don't want to come back to earth. But what they don't understand is you are in training for more responsibilities. It's like wanting to be a doctor on earth and then you, you, you're somewhere in, in high school, you decide I want to become a doctor. And then after your first degree, you decide, oh, I'm just tired of training. How can I become a doctor without doing the rest of it? Can you see what I'm saying? It's a requirement. Mm -hmm. And it's a, it's a requirement that makes us fit for the job that we have to do eternally. Does that, does that help you to understand? I think you're doing a great job explaining it, Norma. Thank you. Rick has, Dr. Rick has an interesting question. He says, Norma, do you feel that what is happening in the world right now changes what we need to do with the knowledge of the loving galaxy, heaven, paradise, nirvana, etc.? Well, please tell him I thank him for that question. Exodus. Ever heard of the word Exodus? And I don't mean the 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 the, um, the part in the Bible. Exodus. We are moving. Humanity has to move to another level. And when I say Exodus, I'm talking about lifting your consciousness from this lower vibration to the highest you can possibly take it. And if you listen to me, I've been as far as 16 and they tell me I still haven't hit heaven yet. <laughs> We're in Thank school. You. It's a learning curve. Absolutely. It's the movement of people from one state of consciousness to another. We want peace on earth. Well, we've got to experience collectively, individually and collectively, all the things that are keeping us from being able to have heaven on earth. And until we master all that, we, we're not going to get there. So we're talking about an exodus moving from a lower vibration and a lower level of consciousness to the highest we can get. Because eventually when we get to this other dimension, um, if we're not prepared, then we might very well be living in hell. So earth is, a, earth is a training ground. It's a school that prepares us for the next level. And the next level is tied very much to that statement of vi It's about vibration. It's about frequency. And all of that is very important. And that's what we're learning. That's what the school of earth is teaching us. Okay, we have another question from Carrie. Lots of questions for you, Norma. Carrie says, I am a Christian that believes in reincarnation. You almost had to come back as a baby right away. I feel there are times that our loved ones wait for us to join them on the other side, and other times they have already returned or reincarnated. What have you discovered about that? Is there anything in the Bible that addresses this? Interesting. What have I discovered about that? Human beings are multidimensional. What do I mean by that? You know why we go to sleep every night? We have to. Because we go home. We travel to other dimensions even though we don't understand that. Because our religion did not teach us that, you see. We are multidimensional. And I'm going to take you, Yvonne, just for just as an example, if I may. All right. I'm having this wonderful conversation here. 
You are healing somebody at the ninth dimension as you sit right there in your seat. We're multidimensional and we function on different dimensions simultaneously. Whether we understand it or not. So yes, some of those loved ones that are waiting to greet you, it's the night time and they have come to greet you, but they've already established a life back, back on earth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Any more? Absolutely. Right? Yeah, oh yes, I've got lots more for you. <laughs> Dana would like to know, do you now feel that you have met the goals of your life plan? I have met the goals that I have set so far. But that mean, that does not mean that I've met all of the goals. I met the goals that I set for this lifetime and whatever other lifetimes I've had, because I couldn't have moved from where I was to, to the point where I am now. But um, who knows how many more goals there are? Because it'll be totally overwhelming if you saw all the goals in one place at one time. You can imagine that. So you're giving it a lifetime at a time. Okay. And Marina would like to know, are the number of dimensions on the other side limitless? I don't know the answer to that. I, I really don't know the answer to that. They haven't given me the answer to that one. But I know I've gone as far as 16, and I did not know 16 existed. <laughs> awesome. Asha has a question. Did your experiences teach you anything about forgiveness that surprised you? Oh, yes. Oh, these are wonderful questions. Oh, yes. I really got shocked on that one. Forgiveness is a two-way stream. When you forgive somebody, you also have to forgive yourself. Why? <laughs> and this is hard for some people to accept when I speak about it. You know that person who has become a devil's advocate in your life? And oh my God, all you could think of is the negativity that they bring to you. I want you to... um. Bear with me here, because I know this is going to be a little hard to understand. Can you imagine this picture? That you've got a loved one on the other side, and, and you know, you, you move from lifetime to lifetime, and you keep up with one another, and you know how much this person loves you. But you find, perhaps, that there is a particular lesson you have to learn, uh, that with all the love that is given to you, you don't seem to be able to, to learn it. Do you know what we do then? We get to the other side and we find this person who really, really, really loves us. And we say, I'm going to ask you to do something for me that is going to require um, a lot of work. And that is, can you be the devil's advocate in my life, in the next lifetime, to force me to learn what I need to learn? And I pause there deliberately for you to think about that. Because when you travel a lot back and forth, you run into souls where there's, there's the ones waiting for the, for the soul to cross over. And then when the soul crosses over, you will watch them hug one person so tightly and they will say, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You did a wonderful job. I'm now free of whatever it is I could not get rid of before. So this is the reason why forgiveness is so important. You have to forgive yourself for having taken yourself to a place where you had to ask another soul to be devil's advocate in your life so that you can release. And so this is why uh, forgiveness is very important. And when I teach, when I teach, I teach classes. And I say to people, don't even think of attempting a meditation class if you have not learned how to forgive. Because people will tell me, I can't meditate because every time I try to meditate, all this stuff comes up to the surface. Well, yes, when I teach meditation, before you meditate, you've got to go through the process of forgiveness. 
You forgive the person and you forgive yourself. You forgive the person who may have done whatever it is to you because you probably did it to somebody in, in some other soul in another lifetime. So forgiveness is important before we even go to meditation. Does that make sense? Yes, your answers are very profound and touching everyone very, very deeply, Norma. Thank you. Ken, Ken has another question for you. Can you give some specific recommendations for reaching a higher state of consciousness? What specific practices or actions should we take? First, we go to the pub. Very good question. First of all, yeah. study the power of intention. But when I say study the power of intention, I'm not talking about the intention to get rich. I'm not talking about the intention to, 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 to just live a totally happy life because a totally happy life. And some people live that because they want to experience it. A totally happy life is a totally useless life. You don't learn anything out of it. But um, we need to really understand this earth is not our home. So one of the first things I put my classes through, self-discovery. Who are you? And I would encourage anybody listening here, and I don't want you to feel like it's because I'm promoting my book, but it will help you to understand it very, very well. Because I had a 97-year-old man and his wife put me through the process of self-discovery. Who are you? When people ask me who I am, I tell them quite clearly, I was, in my lifetime, I've held three different um, passports. But if you ask me who I am, I'm a child of God. I belong in the spiritual world of the kingdom. That's who I am. But while I'm here, I've got this disguise, you see, that I use very well and I fool myself, but that's who I am. So you begin the process with self-discovery and you really make very sure that you understand that you are a spirit that carries all the information of the universe and you maintain it inside of you with your breath. Every breath that you take, you take in the entire universe, which has the capacity to manifest and do all things. And then once you take it in now, you know it has the capacity to release out of you when you breathe out whatever needs to be removed. And when you get that, then you can get to the power of intention. Because you see, you have worked on releasing the ego and you have worked in an understanding that you have responsibilities. When you finally left, leave this earth and you are now working on other dimensions, you have responsibilities. And therefore, earth is the place to inculcate and bring into your being discipline. Earth is the place for you to learn how to flow with the energy that we have here uh, that will help you to understand that you are, we are all one. And we are all one because we are attached to this thing called the breath. Because the breath is a piece of the universe that each and every one of us take in and we let out. So I start off with self-discovery and then I move to breath work. So that you can use the breath uh, to manifest the power of your intention. Because once you discover who you are, you stop asking. You see, I teach people, stop telling God. Stop telling God what to do. Please, stop it. Because God is not a man, first of all. I am not a woman. You, Yvonne, is not a woman. You're only a woman when you're on this plane. But if you live eternally, you're not going to live eternally as a woman. You won't be a man. You won't be a lot of things while you're going through this experience. You see what I'm saying? So we have to get real. 
The information we need is inside of us, and our breath is the key to taking us there. And when we get there, we ask, what we're going to ask is, teach me, show me, guide me. Not to spend the time telling God what to do in the name of the Lord. I mean, <laughs> I suspect, you know, I look out the window one minute to go there. If you got trees out there, they're 400 years old. Who's keeping them alive? How are they kept alive? Nobody's watering these trees to keep them alive, but are they? So don't go to the universe and tell the universe it is running universes what to do, but rather ask, teach me, show me, guide me, direct me, help me to know who I am, help me to know that I am one with every source that there is on all the planets. So discipline, authenticity, compassion, but above all, if you're going to ask for, ask to be reminded of the love that you carry inside because we all carry that love inside. You see, when I discovered that my purpose, part of my purpose in this lifetime was going into prisons and working with prisoners. And I asked the question, well, how am I going to stand before people who I know have created really bad things in the world? How am I going to do that? Show me. And I'm driving and it's a hot summer's day and I believe my air conditioning in the car had broken down. I think I was taking the car to get the air conditioning fixed. And I came up to a red light and the windows were down because the air conditioning wasn't working. And this car pulled up on my right hand side. It was a sports car with a top down and there was a Bob Marley piece of music playing very loudly. And just as the light was about to change, I caught this line. The biggest man you ever did see was once a baby. And he drove off and I drove off and he will never know what he did for me that day. Because when I walked into, when I walk into prison from that day onward, I didn't see men or women who created horrible things. I saw little babies who came into the world with love, seeking love. And then I'd ask the question, what happened between babyhood and manhood or womanhood? See what I'm saying? So above all, you have to ask for love, ask for compassion, seek to be more loving because loving will bring you the fruits of the spirit. And the fruits of the spirit is love, it's compassion, it's, it's, it's empathy. And I also want to say to those who might be listening who, you know, have been well endowed with money in this world. You see, if you came into this world with a plan that says you are here to manage, you're coming to manage money and to experience what it will do for you, you couldn't run away from that even if you tried. And if you wrote a plan that says, I am here so that I can experience what poverty and lack of having even the basic things in life. If that's the plan you wrote, you can't get away from it either. Now, I know some people would say that well, that's difficult, but this earth is not our home. We won't be here forever. So we're using it to learn everything we can so that we don't have to keep coming back forever. I hope that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Th thank you, Norma. Bill is asking a question that's relating to what you just said. So I'm going to ask that question ne next. Bill would like to know, what is your experience of what God is? What is your view on surrendering to God and God's will versus free will and God's will? Thank you very much, Norma. I'm so talk her for that question. It's vitally important because, you see, we have to understand that we think we have free will. Mm -hmm. But what we have is this. You know, many of you are dog lovers. And before, you only had short leashes you can walk dogs on, if you remember that. 
Mm-hmm. And the dogs, usually it will be the dog trying to get more freedom than, than he has and can't get it because the lease is too short. And then somebody invented these very, very, very long leashes now, right? So the dog can go off and run and play and, 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 I mean, roll all over the ground and really feel he has freedom until he comes to the end of that leash, right? <laughs> he comes to the end of the leash, freedom is over. Um, I, I have some serious, serious, serious understandings of, of free will. As a matter of fact, there was a point in my my growth and development and I asked God, whatever free will I have, can you take it away, please? Because what it's doing is keeping me reincarnating lifetime after lifetime after lifetime because I'm asking for what I think I want. Surrendering means that you are... As a matter of fact, I still attend church. And I'm called the surrender lady because I'm constantly telling people, well, you're having all these problems and so on and so on. Stop telling God what you want, how you want it solved. Just surrender. And if you surrender, you may very well find that you'll get out of it quicker. And why would you get out of it quicker? Because this, this, this force, because as I said, God is not a man. This force is nothing but love. So when you surrender to love, you become love while you're here on earth. When you're on the other side, you are pure love. And once you've experienced that, you see what I'm saying? You, and you come back with that experience, you understand that you're not really asking for love. You are love. So since I've come back now, it is like, can you help me to access more of that love that I'm carrying inside of me? So the whole notion of, of, of free will, yes, we'll keep coming and going. If we choose in this lifetime that we are not going to uh, follow what the requirements is, well, we kind of will be allowed to do that. Why? Because the Spirit knows there's an endless amount of lifetimes for you to learn it. So when you look at it that way, uh, I mean, am I having free will? Really? And I don't do it in this lifetime. I'll have to do it in the next or the next or the next or the next. I think that is my answer to that question. Awesome. Thank you. Your answers have been phenomenal. I've had two people asking this, so I'm going to make it the last question. But if you could please take a stab at answering this question. And it is, is there a hell I love your questions. <laughs> Anybody here ever heard about Marley? Well, Marley sang, you think you're in heaven, but you're living in hell. Time alone, time will tell. You think you're living in heaven, but you're living in hell. The good news about hell is that they are, there is grace and mercy. In this place we call hell, there is grace and mercy. I once had a guide from the other side say to me, um, think about it. And I did. Stop and think about how many wars, how many fires, how many um, disasters are taking place on the earth year by year by year, and how many fires are very much alive um, in the world. And you may begin to get the answer to, is there hell? But the good news is, grace and mercy prevails. And I do believe we are at this place of exodus. We are exodus, exit, exiting from the negative and moving into being able to be real and authentic while we hear of the love that we carry inside of us. And as we learn to do that more, then I believe this plan of heaven and earth will manifest itself. And before I go, I just want to remind each and every one of you listening Spirituality 
is about change. You can't become as spiritual as you should be if you refuse to change. And that change includes speeding up your vibration, letting go of a great deal of information that you have been given to help you to survive on earth. You know, I hear a lot of people say, I want to come back to this earth. Well, you're going to have to learn while you're here very quickly to release and be very comfortable with releasing and letting go of the information that rules and governs this world. Because when we stop coming back to this world, uh, we don't need that information anymore. And this is the place where we have to relinquish it, if that makes sense. So I want to remind people that spirituality is about moving into positive vibrations and allowing those vibrations to be increased. It is also about knowing that we live in a new, we're moving towards a new time. We're moving towards a new place. We're moving towards a new vibration. The earth has already done that. It's the human beings that are holding on to what it is that they will not release. And I want to ask you the question, are you picking up? Are you picking up on the understanding that we have to raise those vibrations? We have to move the frequencies higher. That's, that's what art, art offers us, the opportunity to expand those frequencies. And as we expand the frequencies, then we, we gain the right to be able to live on other vibrations. Now, I want to tell you the ninth vibration is beautiful. That's where music is created. And when you move, when you're traveling through it, you hear beautiful music. And I remember once traveling through it and, and hearing this beautiful piece of music. And I thought to myself, if I had ever stopped and learned how to write music, I'd come back and write it. But I didn't know how to write music. And about three or four year, years later, I'm traveling in a car. And the radio is on on a classical station. And I heard a piece of music, which meant that somebody other than myself had traveled through the ninth dimension, heard it. And because they could write music, they came back and not only wrote it, but had it produced. Isn't that exciting? Awesome. Mm -hmm. I want to thank each and every one. You've had beautiful questions. I will invite you to go up on my website, re Program Your Life, www.reprogramyourlife.org. And of course, there is my book, Awakening, that has been released. It will give you a lot of insight to my background, and it will give you insight into how it is that I began the work of, of growing and expanding my consciousness. It will also um, give you an insight into uh, a lot of the things that I've talked about here today, how they have played out in my own life. So I would encourage you to go to awakening-series, awakening, that's the name of my book, dash series.com. Mm -hmm. And there you will um, get a little bit of understanding of the book. And of course, the book is available on Amazon. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, Norma. And Dana's been putting these into the chat so people can Thank get you. these addresses. Thank you for an absolutely phenomenal presentation. And you did just a, a tremendous job with the questions. Thank you, Norma. Thank well, you. I love the questions because they, they, they were every, every single one of them had a firm amount of depth. And yeah. Blessings to you all, and I hope that you all have a very happy holiday. Be at peace, and regardless of what's going on in your life or in the world, make this holiday a peaceful one mm -hmm. so that you will come out into the new year ready to face, to face whatever there is to face. Thank you. Thank you, Norma. Thank you.